welcome to the 34th episode of the sixth season of the Ubuntu podcast. In this episode, we're going to talk to Ross Gardler from Microsoft Open Technologies. We've also got another time-saving tip and we'll read your feedback. If you're listening or watching live, you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm Mark and joining me this week are Laura. Hiya. Tony. Good evening. And Mr. Alan Pope. Hello. <laughs> How come he gets a mister? Dunno. Because I like him more. Fine. Wow. <laughs> so long. You heard it here first. Yeah. What have you been up to in the last couple of weeks? So for fun. Uh, I played and completed The Room Is on that my that tablet. Is that really bad film with Tommy Wiseau in? No? Sorry, what's what's The Room? It's a, <laughs> it's a game on, a t- on tablets. Oh, on tablet. On tablet. On tablet. What sort of a game is it? Um, it's a puzzle one, but with funky 3D graphics, and you touch and turn things using your finger because it's touch screen. Cool. Um, yeah, it's uh, an eight year old recommended it to me. <laughs> and how long did it take you to complete? Uh, two or three days. Not continuous. <laughs> but it's pretty good, and it's made in Guildford. Oh. So I was. Yeah, no, supporting. Cool. Well, at the oh, cool. at the university? No, just a Guildford software company. Fireworks or something. Fire mm. something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, cool. recommend it. Excellent. You get it from the App, uh, App Store, uh, Play Market. Yeah, App Store if you're on Apple. Yeah. Uh, Play if you're on Google. <laughs> Apparently also on Kindle. Yeah. Fair enough. Very good. Alan, what about you? <laughs> I did some hardware maintenance. Ooh, oh, did you hit yeah. it with a hammer? Uh, no, I screwed it with a screwdriver. Beautiful. And uh, my my video card started making a horrible noise, so I bought some fans from That's what happens. from China. Uh, this was before I touched it. Oh. Uh, and the uh, yeah, and it turns out I got the wrong fan. <laughs> and well, they sent me the wrong fan, so oh, I complained, I and they're sending me new ones. But because it's coming from China, it was like another three weeks, and I got impatient. So I looked at these fans and uh, someone online suggested that I could stop them making a horrible noise by squirting uh, sewing machine oil inside them. Does that not just make the sewing machine oil flick out as they go around? <laughs> Surprisingly enough, not. Because you don't squirt a lot. <laughs> it's not like, you know, um, a, a five litre thing of Castrol GTX. While you pour it's spinning. Into the <laughs> it's not quite like that. We're talking a little bottle. It's quite tiny. And you're supposed to use a tiny pipette or a syringe to put a drop in, spin around and that's it, job done. And actually I put it all back together again, put it back in PC and it worked perfectly. Hmm. Lovely. Aww. So I was quite chuffed with that. Yeah, because I normally hate doing DIY on my computer. Hardware type DIY on my computer. Right. And that mm-hmm. works and now I can play lots of games and I'm happy. What have you been doing then, Tony? I, uh, you've well, got something in your hand which you seem to be eager to show us. Well, this, this is coming off the back of Alan's uh, hardware maintenance. The power supply in our little um, small form factor server yeah. um, died. It's one of these DC to DC power supplies. It's an 80 watt one um, that basically takes the input from a laptop type, type adapter and turns it into an ATX supply for a motherboard and disk drives and stuff. Right. The trouble is I can't find one online that is like this one that I'm now showing the Tony's webcam. Tony's holding it up to the Stop webcam in the hope that someone will, uh, <laughs> someone will recognise it. For someone who knows how to do video, he's very rubbish at holding things in front of a camera, isn't he? Hello. Well, let oh, me you can see it's like a white blur. This. So, um, basically, it seems to have died. The power supply itself is fine. Either I need to buy a new server which can take four or five disks, in which case, please send me some recommendations, or somebody can help me out with one of these uh, power supplies. It needs to be this one and not the type of Pico PSU type that you can currently buy online because it won't fit in the form factor case I have. So, if you understand all that and you have any <laughs> ideas, please help. Uh, yes. Yeah, I found one on linitx.com. Cool. Right. Problem solved. <laughs> I knew there was a I, reason I we did this. I bet it's the one that I've seen before and it won't fit. But anyway, okay. let's have a talk about that, maybe, while we're having some cake. However, first, <laughs> should we talk to Ross Gardler? Let's do that. We've got Ross Gardler from Microsoft on the line. Hello, Ross. Hi, Mark. It's good to speak to you again, and hello to the rest of the team. Hello. How are you doing? Hello. So, uh, yeah, I was going to say good evening, but it's not evening for you, is it, because you're over in uh, in Redmond? That's correct. Yeah, it's just coming up to lunchtime for me. Wow. Um, so some people might know you already because you have done quite a lot of work with the Apache Foundation in the past, and you're currently president of the foundation. Am I right? 
Uh, I am at this point in time, that's right. Who knows how long that will last. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, a lot of people will know the name Apache because of the web server, of course. But um, the Apache Foundation is quite a bit more than just um, the web server. So can you just tell us a bit about um, what your role is at the foundation and what it does in the sort of grander scheme of things? Um, yeah, well, covering my role is, is, is as easy as possible. Um, my role is to do what needs to be done to make sure that the foundation is running so that developers can do what they need to do, which to write software for the public interest. So I'll come back to what that actually is at the at later. But the most important thing for people to understand is that I have absolutely zero influence over the technical direction of any of our projects. The board who I answer to um, has absolutely zero influence over the technical direction. All we do is make sure the foundation runs. So that's the first misunderstanding people have. They seem to think that maybe Apache has these people in supposed positions of power, um, like directors and president and so on, who have control over projects. That simply isn't true. The people who have control over the projects are the people doing the actual work, doing right. what's important, writing code. Um, so what's the foundation? Um, the foundation is a, is a, a, a not-for-profit. It's a charitable organization. We have over, I should know the numbers, but we, we have well over 130 projects uh, that are what we call top-level projects. Mm -hmm. Those are ones that are official projects and are released with full IP clearance, et cetera, et cetera. We have over 50, uh, in fact, I think it's a bit less than 50 now. We, we graduated a number of projects out of the incubator. The incubator is where projects come into the foundation. So those projects are going to be Apache projects, but there's something at the moment that stops them being top level so it might be that they're still doing ip due diligence it might be that they're still building a, a potentially a, a viable community around the project etc um so, and once they've so ahead sorry i just wanted to clarify on that that 150 that's a lot of projects um and of those which are the ones that you would say are active i don't know how you measure activity whether it's code commits or you know number of downloads or you know bug reports or what what are those are you know your headline projects well there's two different things there. asking which of the headline projects is not the same as asking which of the active projects <laughs> yeah. um so you know our headline projects are things like the web server and hadoop and solar lucene and and uh, you know many of those projects that people read about fairly regularly because they're in the news because of the nature of what they do but uh, many of those projects that we have in there are vital pieces of, of um, code that nobody ever talks about so um the java logging api for example, um, <laughs> is estimated to be in something in the region of 95% of all Java applications on the planet. Yeah. Um, but nobody ever cares about it because it's just a really low-level thing that developers care about and makes their development activity useful. It's like the busy, um, the busy box of or the bash of Java. It's there well, and you it, need it, but yeah. It's not sexy. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And we have a whole load of projects like that that are, are not sexy, but absolutely critical to the tool set. Um, so to go to the first question or first the, the way I would prefer to, to answer the sorry, the question I would prefer to answer, <laughs> um, which is, uh, you know, which of those are active? They're all active. Um, because we have an, a, a, a place called the Attic where we put inactive projects. Right. And at the moment, I'm not sure how many there are in there. I'd have to have a look. But uh, we, occasionally, we retire a project to the Attic because it is no longer active. And by active, what we mean is actively maintained. So there needs to be at least three independent people or people running the project so that it can be independent. So... By independent, we mean not all working for the same paymaster. Uh, okay. Oh. Um, so Apache Software Foundation doesn't pay for any software development at all. It's all volunteer-driven. Now, the problem with volunteer-driven is that they have to be paid by somebody somewhere, mm -hmm. and you know that's open to abuse in an open-source project. It could be that a, a company invests so many resources into a project that they own the project. Yeah. Now, by, by active, we mean that that isn't happening and can't happen. So the way we manage our projects, we have a whole process that prevents anybody taking ownership. If that process falls down because not, there are not enough active people, then the project will get retired at that point. Right. So how does a project become uh, an Apache <laughs> Foundation <laughs> project? 
So that goes back to the other end of the lifespan of an attack, the Apache project, which is the incubator that I mentioned earlier. So what would happen is somebody would come along and say, hey, I've got this project uh, or I've got this idea for a project and I want to make it an Apache project. Are there any mentors here who are willing to help me make a real project, a real Apache project out of this? If they can recruit sufficient mentors, and mentors are people who've been around the ASF for a long time and understand how the ASF works and how to make the most of the, of the ASF, um, then that project can enter the incubator. Through the process of incubation, the mentors help guide and help people learn what we call the Apache way, which is this process for making sure that the project is viable. Assuming it becomes viable, i.e. it has a active committer base that is not managed by a single or not owned by a single uh, organization and then it becomes a top level project how long do you give them to get that far as long as they need um, so there's no time limits on this kind of thing it's it's if there are enough mentors actively working with the project community and there are enough people actively working at solving whatever problems as they're facing at that point then they can stay in the incubator for as long as they like so not long ago um, JSP wiki um, graduated and I, I I have to look it up, but I have a feeling it was incubating for somewhere around about six years wow, wow. <laughs> Now, that's a very long time. Yeah. Most people get through in anywhere between six and 12 months, right. depending on you know, what, what background they have. And it's also important to understand that graduation isn't dependent on a functional code base. It's depend dependent on a functional community. Right, okay. Right. Okay, and the code base can come later. So cool. we, we incubate communities, not code. Okay. Communities, code. Um, okay. Well, moving moving on a bit from Apache, you recently uh, started working for Microsoft. Now, that might seem to some people to be a bit odd, given that you've got this big open source background, because aren't Microsoft the bad guys? <laughs> um, some people see it that way, absolutely. Um, I, I work for a company called Microsoft Open Technologies Incorporated. Right. So we're a fully owned subsidiary of Microsoft. Um, why have I come over here is kind of implicit, and I, uh, it's because Microsoft aren't the bad guy. Um, it doesn't matter what you think about how they might have been in the past and their approach to open source in the past. Mm -hmm. Microsoft get it, and it's as simple as that. I'm an open source guy. Microsoft have an awful lot of resources that they want to invest into open source projects. And I've been seeing this happening more and more over the years in my engagement with open source. I love open source. It's been putting money into my pocket so I can put food onto my family's table for a long, long time. Microsoft have the resources to make sure that those communities that I'm interested in can continue to flourish. So when you say Microsoft are putting you know, money into your pocket, that's great. And <laughs> congratulations. Um, what, um, are, are we talking about Microsoft projects that are becoming open source? Are we talking about projects that, that they're starting? Or are we talking about existing projects that Microsoft are investing in? What's, is there a proportion split there or is it all one or...? Okay, well, first of all, I didn't say Microsoft are putting money in my pocket. Well, they are. Okay. <laughs> hey, mate, what I said was open source puts money in my pocket. Ah, okay, okay. And Microsoft have hired me because I know how open source puts money in my pocket. Okay. And, and they want to engage with that. They want to understand that. And, and that's partly what I bring to the team here. It's an understanding of the open source world. There are a lot of people across Microsoft who have been contributing to open source long before I joined the company. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing how much engagement there is with the open source communities across the company as a whole. Um, Microsoft Open Technologies are um, a unit that is focusing on that interaction between the open source, non-Microsoft uh, technologies and the Microsoft technologies. And my background as an open source guy can, can, can fit right there. That's exactly what I do. So to come to... Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I'll so, answer the second question in a moment. Uh, so, uh, Microsoft Open Technologies, are they sort of, you know, are you a team of developers or are you a team of sort of PR people interfacing between these two groups of people or what, what's your actual sort of your function? So, we, we are a group of, uh, at the moment, about 35 people. Um, we have another varying number of people that come and go uh, on specific projects. I think there's about 70 with us at the moment in that category, and, and we're expanding all the time. Um, and those people all come from different backgrounds. So, there are developers who are actually writing code and making commits to, to projects. Right. 
there are uh, people from the various business groups around Microsoft who are perhaps open sourcing their own code. And I'm trying to answer the previous question at the same time, mm. um, who are open sourcing Microsoft code or contributing fixes or features back into open source code as a result. Um, there are people who work in the standard space. So we have, a, a, as well as the developer team, we have the standards team. Um, and they work at the, the other end of openness, the definition of open standards and the, the, the agreement to the standards that we're going to work against. Right. Uh, and then there's people like myself. I'm what's called an evangelist. Um, so it's not really PR. You mentioned PR. It's not PR. It's about going out there and, and doing this kind of thing. It's about talking to the open source communities. It's right. about making open source communities understand and also, and most importantly, listening to the open source communities mm -hmm. and bringing that back into the company. So, well, I, I, I'm, I'm still struggling to understand what, where we would see the visibility of the people working in uh, Microsoft Open Tech. Where would okay, we encounter so, them? So, I'd, flippantly, I'd say in any open source project, but clearly that's not true. There are so many out there, it wouldn't be any open source project. But, for example, Microsoft is, uh, last year or last time they did the analysis, was one of the top five contributors to the Linux kernel. So, you can find Microsoft employees yeah. contributing to the Linux kernel, and not just contributing, but contributing in the top five. Was that, was uh, that not through one specific code drop of the virtualization stuff? So that was, yes, it is a virtualization stuff. It's to make sure that Linux will run on Hyper-V, right. which is our virtualization platform. And the reason that there was so much there is because it was a lot of work to get that kind of functionality into the kernel so that the kernel maintainers were satisfied that everything was above board, everything was fine. There's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of um, technical details to iron out there. So there was a lot of work involved. Yes, it was one core function, make Linux run on Hyper-V, mm -hmm. but the impact of that is huge, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about VM Depot and Windows Azure and things like that. So I know you mentioned to me that that's something you wanted to talk about, so we'll come back to that later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's also in many other areas. So um, if we went to um, msopentech.com slash projects, um, you'll see a list of, I don't know how many there are, I've got it in front of my screen here, there's probably 70 or 80 projects that we as MS OpenTech have committed uh, engagement with. And they're things like CouchDB, uh, Dash, which is a, a standards media player, various gaming frameworks, MongoLab, Redis, LucidWorks, Apache Zupi, Keeper, Hadoop, Hudson, WebRTC, Reactive Extensions, etc. etc. Et et it et cetera, is an cetera. impressive list, and that page does keep scrolling for a long way. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not complete. You know, that's a page we remember to put things on. Um, cool. And that's, um, many, and that's just open across Microsoft, there's a whole load more. So we here at OpenTech don't contribute to Apache Hadoop, for example, mm -hmm. but the, the, there, are, there is a team inside of Microsoft that contributes. So it's not just what we're doing on that page, it's hundreds of other projects elsewhere as well. Okay. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned just briefly there uh, in your last answer, VM Depot. That's something I, I wanted, to, wanted to ask you a bit more about. What, what's VM Depot all about? Uh, it's great to hear somebody say it as VM Depot. <laughs> <laughs> not depot <laughs> not depot yeah but i've been here for uh, uh as, as people might recognize i have an extra english accent i moved over here in july and and they've they've beat me to submission i now say vm depot if you started uh, saying whack instead of slash as well i ah oh, i'm avoiding that one at the moment my kids have started saying awesome which i'm really not very happy mm. about <laughs> um, vm depot depot <laughs> Even when I'm trying to pronounce it the right way, I can't. VM Depot is the right way as far as we can say it. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a repository of community-managed, uh, freely redistributable virtual machine images for deployment onto Windows Azure. Now, the key in that is the phrase freely redistributable. That essentially means every image on there today is Linux. Right. And they run as a first-class citizen on Windows Azure. So I talked a little bit about our contributions to the Linux kernel and why it was so insignificant. We are now able, or you, or the community, are now able to run Linux-based images on Windows Azure or on Hyper-V in your uh, hybrid cloud environments, if that's what you want to do. So now, 
so sorry does that mean that they're also they're the it's just you know base linux systems or are these appliances and you know, what sort of appliances are they uh, so these are these are appliances and they're anything that you want to do if you can make it run on linux yeah uh, any other freely distributable operating system that, that that can run on Hyper-V doesn't have to be Linux. It just so happens that Linux is all of the, the all the different ones we have on there. So they go right from base distributions, and we have I think about seven or eight different base distributions on there at the moment, um, all the way through to complete stacks of things like CCAN, which is a uh, it's what in the UK is used to drive the uh, data.gov.uk. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, activities. Um, it's a data, open data management tool. So that's two complementary VMs, a web front end and a, and a database back end, which you configure to, to talk to one another. Mm-hmm. And then you've got Drupal, you've got WordPress, you've got various developer stacks, you've got LAMP stacks and LAP stacks, and you've got, you know, pretty much anything. We Today, uh, I imagine, I haven't looked at the numbers today, but I think we probably crossed the 600 mark. Uh, well, there's certainly uh, 63 pages each one with lots on. So yes. <laughs> there's quite a lot of them. And yeah, absolutely. These are contributed by external, these aren't ones you've made. These are ones contributed by a community. Is that right? That's correct. There isn't a single image on there that Microsoft have put on there. They're all community images. Um, and the reason for that is if we start putting images up there, you know, if we put, let's say, 600, that's kind of difficult to scale. You know, we've got to maintain those images. We've got to make sure they're kept up that's, to date. That's what I was going to ask. Who, who maintains? I mean, I can see a load of them from one particular publisher, for example. Are they yeah. responsible for keeping both the base image of whatever Linux distro it is, in this case Ubuntu, up to date, but also the applications that are inside that VM as well? Uh, Okay, so um, it's a community effort. So in that particular case, you said it was an Ubuntu base image. Uh, Ubuntu is managed and maintained by Canonical. And that particular company, as far as I'm aware, builds their images on top of the canonical maintained image. And if you wanted to take one of those images that are already there and make some changes, maybe, uh, I know Mark works in the education sector, so maybe Mark would want to take an instance of Moodle and rather than just have a base install, he might want to customize it um, with the logos of his local college or something like that. And then he can put that up there so that that can then be deployed by uh, individual professors at the college. And each of those professors might then create further derivatives that have different modules in useful to their topic area, etc. So that's what we mean by it being a community uh, resource. The idea is that the community can build on what's already in there. Right. I understand. Right. I'm afraid that we're running out of time, Ross. So uh, we're going to have to leave it there. Um, is there a, where can someone go to find out more about uh, Microsoft? <laughs> about Microsoft. <laughs> Microsoft Open <laughs> Technology specifically. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Microsoft is Microsoft.com, I guess most people. Yeah. Would, yeah. Probably work that out. Um, <laughs> MS Open Tech is, is, is MS Open Tech, or one word, dot com. Right. Uh, my, my Twitter handle is R Gardler, R G A R D L E R. And if you have any specific questions, feel free to contact me directly. Cool. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. All right. You're welcome. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Cheers. Ross. Cheers, Thanks. Bye. 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 The levels of professionalism on display this evening are simply outstanding. (laughs) So, we have a command line love. We do. Mm. What is it this time? Man ASCII. Man ASCII. It's a man page. Yes. That's our command line love, a man page. Yep. And And it's a good one. Technically, man is the command, and I think we've had that before. (laughs) We've had man before. I've had man before on this show. Right. Uh, But this is a specific man page so a man page is what alan it's a document help okay. it's like Structured a help document, file right. yes but this is a specific one that is quite handy mm-hmm. for looking up the ascii codes for characters sometimes you want to look them up for whatever reason regularly yeah yeah uh I, i've had to recently when i i was looking at a file trying to uh, figure out why it was not being read properly by something. And I did a hex dump. I think we've mentioned HD we have. Uh, before. And um, I wanted to know what the characters were in the hex dump. And I recognised a few of them, like 32 being space and a few of the others. But I, I couldn't recognise some of them. And so, man, ASCII. 
is handy because it's a giant table that lists out all the ASCII characters and their codes. Can't you just decimal do, and octal and all that? If you use a hex editor, doesn't it doesn't normally have a thing down the side which converts the bytes into ASCII anyway? Yes, it does. It may well do, yes. Mm. But if you are not... But in my hypothetical scenario, it didn't. <laughs> okay. So there. Excellent. So uh, that, is a, that is a page worth remembering. There. But also, there's references at the bottom of... It, it doesn't end there, Tony. Oh. Hang on. Oh, God. It's the uh, command that just keeps giving. Uh, yes, it is. At the bottom of man, ASCII, uh, the ASCII man page, yes. as we've already established, there are further related pages for the ISO you know, code pages for uh, all the other types of characters not just ASCII wow the excitement just there. doesn't end so like accented characters and so on if you want to know what the codes are for accented characters yeah is this weird sort of slightly non-standard codes or is it Unicode codes uh, well you just have to read the page and find out okay we'll leave the listeners to find that out for themselves as um, a treat for you you mean you don't want to read out all the ISO codes that they are that are referenced at the bottom of this page no, in turn, into the microphone. No, no, no. I mean, they're mostly ISO what? Uh, 8859, aren't they? ISO underscore 8859 dash 15 bracket 7 close bracket yep. is just one of the many exciting <laughs> ISO man pages that you can find linked to from the bottom of the ISO, uh, the man ASCII page. Yes. It's like reading RFCs. No, no, no it's way more interesting than reading <sighs> RFCs. RFC love. Coming to a podcast <gasps> near you. Oh, yeah. yeah, Linux lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. It's time for your feedback. And in the latest batch of feedback, Rich Armstrong emailed us at podcast at ubuntu-uk.org to say... Whenever the topic of gaming crops up on the podcast, there seems to be a collective groan from the presenters and a fairly dismissive attitude, which was evident when you discussed Steam OS last week. I don't think you gave the subject the attention it deserved. Is it because you're not interested in gaming, or don't think that gaming drives innovation and Linux adoption? Steam are not only promising to close the performance gap between Windows and Linux, but are potentially bringing Linux into many more living rooms and making it a more attractive proposition for developers to develop native Linux applications. Yeah, Is Tony. this not a good thing for the Linux community? Yeah, Tony. Why do you hate Linux so much? Yeah. yeah. Well, because I, he hates freedom. I'd yeah. like to make something absolutely clear. Is that um, when uh, um, Rich says that we all boo uh, the idea of uh, gaming on Linux, that is 100% factually correct. None of us... <laughs> it's Okay, it's 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 25% factually correct, and that 25% is Tony. Yes. <laughs> I mean, Rich, Unless it's Simpsons tapped out on his phone. That, yes. yeah, that, that is, is the single game Tony has played ever. That's not a game, that's a lifestyle choice. <laughs> okay. so, so it's a bit of a shtick, and it it's, is. yes, it's basically us taking the mick out of Tony every single episode where we can. We game... make him read the gaming news because yes. he's no idea what he's reading. There, yes. w- w- there are better ways of spending your time. You could write a text editor rather than playing a game. Or you could watch an old episode of Doctor Who that you've seen 50 times before. Yep, you so, could. Do. So in answer to your you concern, could pay Rich, for tickets if I can to go into London edge, right? no. and no. watch no. a show that you've We've seen them off. thousands of times and uh, know all of the characters Intimately, yeah. Or you could play a game, yeah. Or you could, you know, go and see something new and different on on a West End stage uh, in London. You know, it's not just about things you've seen before. But um, can anyway. I just bring you briefly back to the point? <laughs> Rich might like to go back and listen to some of our archive episodes, particularly the one where he might not. Alan and Mark. <laughs> Bang on about games. <laughs> for, the whole episode, for the whole episode. If you can hear it without bleeding your ears. You see, Rich, you, you send in an email saying there's a collective groan. Go and listen to that episode and then tell us if you still want more of that. <laughs> <laughs> because that, my friend, is what happens when you let these two unsupervised on the podcast. That was a particular low point. <laughs> <laughs> the content was good. The production was terrible. Production values on that album are amazing. But I was able to listen to it live from the middle of nowhere in the Lake District. So yeah. it's yeah. not that bad. So, yeah. yeah, we managed to stream the waffle. It's yep. just it wasn't a particularly high-quality waffle. Yes. Tune in next week for more streamed waffle. <laughs> <laughs> mm, streamed waffle. <laughs> <laughs> and Hamish Downer also emailed us, podcast at ubuntu-uk.org, to say... 
I thought you and your listeners might be interested to hear what happened at PyCon UK. On the Saturday, there were talks from some teachers and playing with Raspberry Pis, culminating in a code dojo uh, to use the Python API provided by the version of Minecraft on the Raspberry Pi. Ooh, that sounds like fun. Yes. On the Sunday, we had about 35 kids join in, age 6 to 13, and with an even gender split for a Raspberry Jam. Various games were made using Scratch, yay, and in Minecraft, the kids were making rockets and even a TARDIS. Mm. <laughs> What's see bigger see what you're in? missing out on, Tony? Games and, and a TARDIS. TARDIS. You, can't, you can't make things bigger on the inside in Minecraft, can you? I don't know. Uh, and one group, <laughs> with significant help from adults, were able to control a quadcopter by moving a character around in Minecraft. Brilliant. That sounds awesome. That's my recollection anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Was Did it just a dream? See pink elephants flying around. <laughs> <laughs> Linux user have what is most certainly a more accurate article, uh, and there's a link we'll put in the show notes. And there's a video of the Minecraft quadricopter mashup on YouTube as well. And he's also provided a bunch of other links. Uh, hmm. The two days were pretty damn cool, smiley face. Well, if you like two day events that are pretty damn cool, come to our camp. Yes, it is next week. It'll be, it'll be this, this week. This week. This weekend, in fact. Yes. It's coming up in. Two days. two days. But if you're listening live, it's next week. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're if you <laughs> if it's the future and you've been told to go back and listen to this episode for some reason, if you're to find watching out this show on like Dave, Dave. Yeah. yeah, if you're watching this show on Dave. <laughs> So yeah. this this was covered uh, by the Guardian as well. That that could be because one of the organisers is a works at the Guardian. Yeah. But um, yeah, it sounds like it was fun. So I'm going to see if we can get somebody to come and talk about it on the show. Yes. Oh, what, PyCon? Yes. Mm. Sweet. Back at the point. So thank you for emailing in, Hamish. That's really good to hear. And uh, in the previous episode, we mentioned the Intel Galileo board and whether it uh, had a video out. Well, Tommy Bobbins was listening live in the IRC channel and had some comments. Laura, what does he say? I don't think that Galileo has video. The tray does... And it's the tray that has power VR. Yes, I made a mistake last week ah. or earlier. Uh, <laughs> that I said the Galileo had power VR GPU, and this was wrong. I was wrong. Uh, the tray, which is the other uh, device that Intel announced, which is uh, ARM based. Right, okay. And has power VR. So does that mean the Galileo is genuinely all open? Apparently so. Wicked. Excellent. Well, I should probably start to play some music at this point. Shall I do that? Go on, then. The Ubuntu Podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that enthralls, exasperates, or elevates you, tweet at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook, and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. Please do get in touch. I mean it. Just one message. Just to know there's someone out there who cares. That's all for this episode. Thank you very much for listening. Our next show will be recorded at Og Camp and released on the 24th of October. The next live show will be on Wednesday the 6th of November at 16.30 Atlantic <laughs> Standard Time. And that's half past eight in the evening for those of you in the UK. Super. Excellent. We, we're getting dangerously close to that point of the year where the clocks change in the UK, aren't we? Yes. It will be... The next show will be... The next live show will be back to... GMT. I think that's why we've clarified that by putting it in Atlantic right. Standard Time. Right. What, which countries are in Atlantic Standard Time? Uh, oh, you can look them up. There's probably a man page about it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do that. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.